All right, our next speaker this afternoon is Avi Patel. Avi's joined us from Caltech um, and he's been working this summer with Dahlia. Um, and today he's gonna tell us about their project together using machine learning to extract novel information from Zwicky transient facility light curves. Okay, um, thank you, Gwen, for that inter introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Um, okay, so Zwicky Transit Facility um, is operated out of the 48-inch Samuel Ocean Schmidt Telescope from Palomar Observatory in San Diego County. Um, it has a pretty wide field of view, so it's able to quickly scan the entire northern hemisphere of the sky down to a declination of uh, 30 degrees. Um, making it an ideal um, instrument or facility for uh, performing, you know, wide, large survey science sort of within the time domain astronomy. Uh, so here are a few examples of light curves from ZTF. Um, the, the key thing here is, the key takeaway is just to illustrate kind of, to get a flavor of the different types of light curves that are coming out of ZTF, like the different um, shapes. Um, so up here we have type two supernova, a tidal disruption event. Um, type two Cepi and then Myra, and also like the different sort of sampling rates or, or yeah, the sparsity of the points and then also like the, the noise as well in the, in the light curves. So. so like, why do we care about applying machine learning to ZTF light curves? Well, ZTF issues around uh, one, one million source to one million alerts every night. And um, from its most recent data release, um, it has made about 768 billion source detections and it's constructed about 4.7 billion light curves from these single exposure detections. Um, since there's both limited time and resources available to perform follow-up studies on all of the sources coming out of ZTF, um, you know, it is important to, to develop a framework and machinery to prioritize what sources should be followed up by other facilities um, to maximize scientific discovery in, in time domain astronomy. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, when we work, when we're working with these like larger sets of data, there's higher chances of discovering new types of events. And um, to you, be able to, you know, use machine learning to, to monopolize on like that, that, that fact is really important instead of just visually vetting and trying to understand, you know, find, find interesting sort of gems in the data sets. Um, and then lastly, ZTF is a pathfinder survey to uh, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time operated, um, which will come online um, in the near future out of the Verisi Rubin Observatory. And it is currently ZTF is operating about like 10% scale to what LSST will, will be once it comes online. Okay, so now uh, why are we using unsupervised machine learning in the first place? Well, pretty much our goal our case is that we want to look at finding the unknown in ZTF light curves, right? Which is exceedingly difficult using conventional supervised machine learning techniques that classify sources into different bins, let's say different buckets, right? Um, and unsupervised machine learning is a powerful tool for us to visualize, you know, complex multi-dimensional data sets that, you know, we cannot simply plot in a two or three dimensional space. Uh, take the this simple example of working with the NIST uh, data set. It's just a data set of digits. Um, every digit is uh, a 28 by 28 pixel array. And what our unsupervised machine learning or dimensionality reduction does is it takes our you know 28 by 28 um, vector for every single uh, just every single digit, and it reduces the representation into 2D feature space. So. As you see here, these different clusters kind of represent the different the different digits coming out from this from this data set right here. So we intend on applying a, or we we have applied a very similar technique, but instead of looking at these digits, we're looking at using uh, light curves, right, and representing light curves as points in two D feature space. So we're taking a set of light curves, um, and we're extracting a, a set of features from these light curves. And you can think of these grids, these delta magnitude, delta time maps, which I'll get into very shortly, kind of as those like digits um, from, the, from the NIST data set that we were looking at. And then we're applying our dimensionality reduction to these sets of uh, DMDT maps and observing sort of these clusters of corresponding to, you know, 
the different types of classes of sources. And I forgot to mention on the uh, previously that you know this is really important technique for being able to mine rare and anomalous types of sources. Um, additionally, finding the hidden relationships in the data and understanding sort of the like physical parameters that are that are physical processes that are driving those those relationships. Is so. Um, Let's talk about like why we even need to do this feature extraction. Well, so light curves are uh, very gappy and unevenly sampled, um, you know, from ground-based observatories. So, applying conventional methods of time series analysis uh, from other fields is you know very difficult, you know, with these particular light curves. So, we need to extract a set of features to to describe them. So, the approach we do is we take um, so given this light curve up here, we take every combination of points on our light curve and we find the difference in time and the difference in magnitude. And we bin these values onto a 2D histogram right below here. And this 2D histogram is um, a delta magnitude, delta time map, which we'll refer to as our DMDT map from here on in this presentation. So here's an example of a set of light curves and we're just adjusting the sparsity of points um, sampled along, you know, from the top is uniform and then the bottom is very sparse. And this is just to kind of get a sense of, you know, what the DMDT maps look like, um, how they sort of map between light curve to map, sort of. Okay, so secondly, once we have these DMDT maps, um, we apply our dimensionality reduction. So the technique we're using is the uniform manifold approximation projection technique. This is a relatively new and popular technique used in um, looking at many different types of multidimensional data sets in uh, different fields outside of astronomy. Um, and it's you know only now kind of becoming you know more and more used in astronomy. Um, so the way it works is you know similar to the NIST data set that I showed earlier um, with the digits. Um, we can take like a data set, um, this case, it's the fashion NIST data set with different articles of clothing. And then we can apply this technique and sort of get a representation of every single image kind of in this 2D feature space. And you kind of see that, you know, the shoes, for example, are kind of clustered together. We have like the t-shirts over here. And it's a great way to visualize like our data set with minimal information loss between like a high, uh, you know, our multi-dimensional data and lower representation. Okay, so this is our main result that we got. And I'll go through every single part of this plot, but it's after we apply our UMAP to our um, set of light, of simulated light curves that we're looking at. So firstly, let's look at this top main sequence up here, right? This is showing how like the period of our, um, of our light curve is changing, right? And what the what's happening is that our um, dimensionality reduction algorithm is able to sort of um, arrange the light curves as by period, you know, from from one period to another. And additionally, if we look at, you know, if we take, for example, one periodic light curve and adjust the sparsity of points in in that light curve, um, we see that, you know, adjusting the sparsity of points, we still are able to get those light curves kind of in that same sort of cluster in that same sort of region of our of our sort of main sequence of of light curves here. Additionally, let's take a look at this branch right here. Um, if we take one periodic light curve from our from our set and adjust just the signal to noise ratio, right? We notice that when we have more and more noise, right, less signal, we we get farther and farther away from our our main, our sort of main sequence of, of periodic light curves. And then lastly, um, let's take a look at a completely different type of, of light curve. Um, one that could model a explosive event, event like a supernova, for example. And we kind of see something very similar with sort of the lighter sort of points and how, you know, when we have more and more noise, right? They kind of sort of are farther away from our sort of main cluster of, defining that sort of class of light curve. So in conclusion, we take light curves, we extract a set of features from them and represent them as these delta magnitude, delta time maps. And then we perform dimensionality reduction on these maps and get a lower representation of 
these light curves as points in 2D space. Um, in the future, what we plan on doing is completely getting rid of this feature extraction step and looking at another technique called dynamic time warp, where we can directly compare um, between different light curves. Um, and this image is kind of showing how that comparison is done between the different points on the light curve and kind of the lines between them. And um, this is a this is a technique that you know we can we can use um, to sort of evaluate and compare against our original I, our, our original feature extraction method. And then lastly, um, we want to apply this method to real ZTF light curves to find you know hidden gems in ZTF light curves. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Javi, great talk. This is great results. Um, I have a question uh, relating slides, I think four and eight. Um, it seems like in slide, uh, you can start maybe in slide eight. Oh, whoops. I think there are your results. Uh, slide nine. Yeah, this is perfect. It seems like in this slide, in your results, you don't have like any contaminants so far. But it seems like you're do, uh, dealing with um, simulated light curves. But if you go to back to slide four, um, this, this one, this yeah, one? yeah, the, okay. this one, perfect. Um, it seems like in this one, there's like a few contaminants. Um, there's not a lot, but this is like real data. So maybe when you deal with real data, you're going to have like some contaminants, um, in, in your like groups. So is there like a way that you're planning on dealing with contaminants at some point, or are you, is this project only focused on simulated data? Yeah. Um, I mean, as you saw kind of with, when we adjusted like the signal to noise of our light curves, we saw that you know the, the groups of points um, or the, of, of light curves for that given class were kind of farther away from those like main sort of mm -hmm. clusters. If I go back to um, sort of this this plot here, right, we see that like the lighter sort of colors are sort of farther away from these sort of main branches. Um, and the reason why the whole point of simulating these light curves is actually to get a real understanding of what's going on when we apply dimensionality reduction, right? Because we don't want to blindly apply it to ZTF light curves and kind of not understand really what's mm -hmm. what's happening. We can, I mean, we can cross match, right, with, you know, ZTF metadata and understand, but this is kind of a better under, a better way to sort of understand and get some sort of intuition on this. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Brad? Yeah, really great talk. I it's often or I find it's often hard to explain machine learning stuff. I think you did a really good job. Um, I had a question about uh the some of the light curve. I think it was the neck one of the next slides, the one where you showed the transient one. Oh, oh going other back, direction. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh the last bit. Yeah, perfect. Um, so when you were talking about contaminants, so when I see this and what I think ZTF does to like determine if there's a transient to follow up, and maybe this is wrong, or a lot of places it's, you know, they're checking to see if the if there's like a dramatic change in the light curve. So like in my head, I would think that they would probably, once they're going on to like classifying it, cut out all of that earlier data before the increase in the light curve. And so I guess what I'm wondering is if if that is what is moving things off of the kind of cluster is just having that extra earlier time data because that's kind of what's determining the scale or like if you had some other sort of I, I could imagine there being a, in real data like people were saying more scatter in the rest of the light curve but but yeah I guess is that what's moving it off of it or yeah I think it's just the the culmination of like the noise in in the light curve that's that's moving it off from that sort of um you see like a lot of like these up here are more, you know, clustered down here. And that's because they have just like a higher signal to noise ratio. Um, and 
uh, I think in general, the addition of noise and you know ability to sort of recover that like signal for that that type of transient um, is, I guess, very important in under in having in being for us to to like understand and have an, an intuition on like where on, I guess what this like machine learning is like classifying or kind of grouping for these light curves. But okay. yeah, like in real time, like ZTF. I mean, if if it's like a fast riser for the night, it will it will send an alert out, right? And then we'll we'll receive it on our end and right. Sure. Yeah. It'll classify it. All right. Let's thank Abby again. Oh.